Let's see. Yeah, yeah. Good evening. Thank you for having me here. It's good to see you. Thank you for reading about cryptobiotic soil. It's a being we sometimes forget about. It's so fragile. Ah, beautiful campus, a beautiful day, and I feel so honored to be in your presence today. And I want to let you know, too, that the Earth is very honored that you're all here. All of you, because you're all indigenous to somewhere, right? You all have people that, that were original um, stewards of land somewhere, so we're all indigenous to somewhere. And we'll talk a little bit about, um, about what that means, where I'm from, which is in the Salmon River Mountains of Idaho. Before I begin, I just want to say um, thank you for hanging out with me last night, Linda, and thank you, Tony, if you let him know. Is he back there? Thanks, Tony. My sister's here. I, um, if you just give her a hand, she was a respiratory therapist for COVID. And, uh, front line worker right there. You took care of a lot of folks. Um, Shelly, thank you so much um, for, for having me. And um, I had the best time with your students this morning, and Gretchen students, and Julie. Um, everybody has just been fantastic. We have repeatedly said, my sister and I, that this is probably the nicest place we've ever been. People are so nice. So it must say a lot about um, the land that you're on and what it means to you and how it affects you deeply. So we'll talk a lot about the land tonight. This is where I'm from. That's the South Fork of the Salmon River. And most of what I'm going to talk about tonight has to do with that area. It's an endangered area. It's a river that we have a chance to do something for before it becomes a harmed river, before it becomes in danger. So I'm, I'm quite partial to it for more reasons than the aesthetic. But I want to start, um, I want to start with my own land acknowledgement. And land acknowledgements are a little fraught and they can be difficult for, for many reasons that you'll hear here in a second. When I became the writer in residence, um, they, the city council in McCall asked me to write a land acknowledgement and this is what I wrote. They've never asked me to do anything since. <laughs> So I succeeded. Yes. All right. Let us pause for a moment and acknowledge the land on which we live. This is the traditional land of the Nimipu and Tukitika. We should take another moment to acknowledge the ways indigenous people have been, are being, removed and erased from the land they've stewarded for over 16,000 years. Swiftly, brutally, culturally, fatally. Let us acknowledge that soldiers for the United States killed women and children because they were Native. Let us acknowledge the recentness of this. Let us acknowledge that Native people buried in their land without markers while unnamed settlers rest fence graves. Let us acknowledge Indian graves dug up and looted. Let us acknowledge the place names like Squaw Meadows and Dead Indian do not honor our ancestors. Let us take a moment and acknowledge that this land was not stolen from the people whose language, culture, and religion was born of it. Let us acknowledge that the people were stolen from this land. The people who celebrate this land with song, dance, ceremony. People who do not commodify and commercialize trees and water or call them resource. Here we pause to acknowledge that the land itself is rarely acknowledged. The land buried beneath asphalt, concrete, floorboards, and foundations. Let us acknowledge that this buried land, which once grew food and medicine, now grows dollar stores, and subdivisions. Let us acknowledge the land in the way subdividers do, with the blade of the bulldozer and with names like Forest Trails, Aspen Ridge, River Ranch, with words, the way the government recognizes the only federally recognized tribes and has taught some natives to recognize others only through paper, and blood quantum, and CIB instead of commitment to rights and sovereignty. Let us recognize land acknowledgments that serve as consolation, another box checked on a list titled due diligences, 
the way wearing a Black Lives Matter t-shirt acknowledges white wokeness, while the same whites shop at white lives businesses. Acknowledgement as performative allyship. Let us acknowledge that internment camps were prisons. This land acknowledgement was written for the people who acknowledge land in the way spotted knapweed acknowledges it, the way a for sale sign acknowledges it, the way the Forest Service acknowledges land by saying hashtag it's all yours and meaning it's not theirs. This statement acknowledges the land in the way the media and FBI acknowledge the over 2,000 missing Native women and children by recognizing the one missing white woman for whom hundreds search and whose picture is present on all our screens the way Native silhouettes are screened on paper to sell cigarettes. This land acknowledgement is inked on the heartwood of a pine that escaped the fires but fell for the mill from a land that cannot help but acknowledge climate crisis, carrying capacities, the grizzly bear fatally removed, and the salmon who can no longer reach their original homelands. This land acknowledges the wolves shot by stockmen and sportsmen to preserve the animal stockmen and sportsmen will thenceforth kill in the name of husbandry and sport. Let us acknowledge how we honor loss with dollars and not grief. Let us make depredation of science and pay officers from the Bank of Conservation. Let us acknowledge the words used to disassociate kill, killer, killer, killing, kill from the act of execution. This land acknowledges it, that this, this land acknowledges that it is recognized for its monetary value, recreational value, and aesthetic value, because it too is living. This land recognizes us by our carbon footprint, our clear cuts, our gold mines, and our greed. This acknowledges that land back means languages back, means medicine back, means ceremony back, means culture back, means reparations, means all people depend on the land. Let us acknowledge that unless action is taken to identify and empower indigenous peoples, erase inaccurate history from every school curriculum, carry out land-based justice and climate change policy, a land acknowledgement is a perfunctory, alienating, and otherwise hollow gesture. Acknowledgement means acceptance, admittance. Acknowledgement is a dead word, is not a verb, is not a deed, does not mean education. Acknowledgement means too late for an apology. Read me your declaration of change. Detail your plan of procedure. Show me your map to equality, and then, maybe just then, I might be convinced that your land acknowledgement is not but another broken treaty. I used to start out with a poem called um, Litany about rattlesnakes. It's like it goes, uh, it starts with, I got a rattlesnake in me. <laughs> and people are like, well, that's one way to scare your audience. <laughs> Apparently that's another. Um, but I hope that it's provocative and I hope it opens your mind to think about some things that we're going to talk about tonight and how indigenous people see the land. So that land acknowledgement is written for indigenous people. So we recognize sometimes how those acknowledgements make us feel as past, as not part of the land still, as a perfunctory statement, as not someone that has a voice in today's conversation. So if you don't mind opening with that or thinking about that as we go into more about the South Fork of the Santa River, which is this place. And I want you to imagine the South Fork of the Salmon River by bringing your hands together. This is interactive. You have to do it with me. There we go. Bring your hands together. And they look like this. You see the V that they form? How it get kind of these steep ridges that go down and these knobs on top. And down through the middle, that's where the South Fork of the Salmon River is going to run. And these drainages that go between your fingers where you see your, your veins coming down, those are different drainages like Phoebe and Nasty and Buckhorn. They're all just creeks that feed into this river. So when you look down, you can see how steep the South Fork of the Salmon River is, yeah? 
And that'll help you imagine how, how uh, steep this area is, too. This uh, piece I'm about to read you comes from a, a um, NPR podcast that I do called Terra Firma. On an early July morning, I sit against the trunk of an old ponderosa pine on a ridge. I can see two rivers, the sea sash, and in the distance, the salmon weaves its way through the canyon it is still cutting. The hillsides are still green from late winter and from heavy spring rain. Walking the trail to get here, the balsam root arrow leaf with their sunflower faces made south facing slopes golden. When the head of a bloom turns just so, the deep center of brown becomes an eye, then it appears as though the entire hillside is arrow leaf eyed, and I am peering into the heart of the Salmon River Mountains. The clouds are gathering to the east. A storm is approaching. This Ponderosa is older than any of the English names of this place, was a sapling before there was a state. Knew the songs of Yumipu, Kukadika, and thousands of birds. How it survived the axe and fires when it was younger, I cannot say, but survival is why I I am learning about tree sway, about how wind makes a tree stronger because the trunk grows like a muscle as the tree moves back and forth. The very thing that might harm the tree is teaching it how to be resilient. I have lain at the base of pines in the wind and watched the crowds arc across the sky. This ponderosa is a reminder of the great effort living takes. The work of it. Not far away, near Thunderbolt Peak, the thunder rolls. It is not only the effort of living, the strength it requires, but resilience that I am learning. Its trunk is naked of limbs for the first 20 feet. The three inch thick bark of this ponderosa tree resembles enormous brown puzzle pieces, and the fires that have crept through have merely blackened thin layers which eventually, naturally, peel off. Science calls the ponderosa fire adapted. Maybe adapted and resilience are more words for survival. But I have come here to experience the storm, the wind, the rain, I saw the gray clouds when I woke, remembered the giant ponderosa, and took the steep hike into the air that, as morning came, grew colder. The breeze has turned to grass. It goes against better thinking, I know. A ridgeline and a thunderstorm. But there are lessons only the wilderness can offer me. Miles below here, where these rivers meet, the Snake River, and then the Columbia. Debates continue about the protection of salmon, the release of dams, the safety of wolves, the survival of Native women. It would be so much easier, I suppose, to walk into the deep woods to shelter. But so much that I care about lies on these ridge tops, in presence or in memory, or just below in or near these mighty rivers. And like the Ponderosa, I need to know survival in this way and in this place. The rain, when it begins, comes slowly, like grace. I push my fingers into the granitic soil and wait. The robin and hermit thrush are quiet. The fledgling woodpeckers in the hole above me have grown silent, too. The wind comes and heaves, tossing the crowns of the ponderosa, tangling my hair. Pollen sweeps across these slopes and my bare skin. Despite my fear, I rise to my full height and relax into the gale. When the storm has passed and the trees have stilled, I thank the ponderosa 
and walk down the trail toward camp. The sun comes out, my hair and clothes begin to dry, and it's then I remember the eyes of the arrow leaf and feel them upon me. I turn once again to look into the heart of these mountains, and in the wind that now echoes down another canyon, I hear the words of an elder who said, learn from nature and fight for it. The eyes of your ancestors are watching. next piece um, was started as a letter that I wrote recently to a friend, Laura Pritchett, who's also a writer, um, during a snowstorm, and it's called Letter Born in a Snow and Rain, and this piece is uh, brand new, it's the first time it's been performed in public, and um, will come out in Tory House's, Tory House Press's Water Anthology in a few months, so... I'll test it. If it's no good, this will be the time to tell me, so I can <laughs> pull it ahead of time. This is called an epistle for writers who are wondering the form of a letter that comes out as kind of a, an essay. Letter born of a snowy morning, McCall, Idaho, March 31st, 2023. Dear friend, this morning I have a mind of snow, but a heart of spring. It seems today may be the day the sun breaks finally through the froth of clouds like a steelhead breaching an icy river. Yesterday, another six inches of snow fall on these Salmon River mountains. This morning, filling the kettle, I marveled at the snow several inches up the kitchen window. I am surrounded by water, and yet I do not drown. I look above the snow to the forest beyond our cabin and try to imagine a different scene, one not dichromatic. When the limbs of pines were not heavy with snow and the transplanted rhubarb, now nearly six feet below this winter white, was leafy and green. I turn the kettle on to boil, and though I know better, I think there is no way all of this snow will ever melt can ever be gone from our woods, will never not be enough. But the sun is writing the truth on the landscape, and the birds deliver the lines to the air, and this should be evidence enough, but we keep turning to other sources, sources outside ourselves, and away from nature for proof, as if it can be found by a search engine, as if it needs to be spoken in our language. The lines of this morning's poem are written in a vocabulary we have forgotten, an instinct we no longer trust, an inward search rarely taken. They are written for a world yet created, known by all our ancestors, and with an intelligence we have yet to achieve. Saturdays, for me, are usually filled with much of the domestic, but today, I pushed chores aside and sat in my reading chair and watched the weather come. It was so like a spring storm. Blizzard, a fine snow, then flakes the size of a squirrel's fist, then grapple, then sun. All the while, the birds feasted on seeds in the feeders and then on seeds that blew to the ground. Like messages from the day's imagination, the birds came. Dark-eyed juncos, mountain chickadees, black cat chickadees, red-breasted nuthatch, and the bigger birds, too. Flicker, sellers jays, and downy. And despite the wind and snow and cold, they sang and chattered. Well, maybe not despite it all. Maybe it was because of it all, they sang. Funny, isn't it? how we have come to talk about the weather. Around town, people are cursing the snow and the patter of storm upon storm and the gray days they bring. They long for weather that suits their needs, whatever those may be. Or perhaps they're just ready to put the heavy coats and broad shovels away. Just yesterday, while brushing the truck off for a trip to town, a neighbor pulled up next to me and said, it's fucking snow. I've had <laughs> enough of it. I must tell you, I wince. His anger, 
though directed at the snow, felt personal. But I've been there. There is work to winter that sometimes feels an inconvenience to our human ways, and there have been times when brushing or scraping the windshield, shoveling the driveway, or being denied a visit because of bad roads caused me contempt toward the weather as well. But that's changing. Last spring, I learned from Haida culture that to curse the weather is to offend it, is to not trust something far wiser and ultimately far more powerful than me. So like the beings with whom I share this place, I now thank the weather as well. Sometimes I find myself apologizing for it. For it can be argued that we and our ways have influenced the weather now, changed or altered its behavior. This, above all, should be a stronger argument against cursing it. When Samuel L. Clemens wrote, Everyone complains about the weather, but no one does a thing about it, he was talking about one thing, but now it means something entirely different. The snow is so deep, the neighbor's cabin can no longer be seen, and the youngest pine in our mixed conifer forest are completely covered. I almost wrote buried instead of covered, but there's nothing dead about the scene. I like to think the cold and white the small trees are covered in is a quilt with a batting of winter that knows how to tuck a young pine in. I imagine what those saplings feel as the snow becomes their air and sky, and when winter finally covers our kitchen window, I might know. Well. It'll be an abstract knowing, as I need these walls as protection. Yet the comfort of this snow is something I think I do understand. My partner, Caleb, calls this salmon weather. And I have started calling the snowstorms salmon weather also. And the snow, salmon snow. I love that name. It alludes to an insurance, but also to a future I'm hoping will arrive. Here at 6,000 feet, the snow is deep and will hang around until June, but up higher, in the places where winter is a song sung even on summer mornings, the snow can hold out into July, often August, like a reservoir, melting slowly, releasing water to streams which flow into rivers. This cold runoff will come when the rivers are at their lowest, their warmest, when salmon are returning, when most fish are spawning, when water, preferably cool water, is what these fishes need most. Another name I love, cold water refugia. What poet would love such a phrase? What mortal sinner could resist the word refugium? Refugium, refugia, Latin for refuge, for hideaway. The words deliver a sense of relief, elicit a memory of safety, or at least the expectation of some kind of temporary amnesty, a rest. The forest has often been my refuge, the wild places, the copse of trees or a mountain lake, a shelter from the conditions of living, a safe place too, like the arms of a good mother, or an accepting lover, or the deep belly fur of my old dog, where I bury my face and cry for the years we've had and the months we have left. Cold water refugia is all of this, but on a Piscean level. In rivers, refugia can come in the form of upwellings, can flow from the mouths of streams, can exist in the shade of bankside trees. Rest areas for salmon and steelhead making the long trip home equally necessary for aquatic dwellers seeking relief from rising river temperatures. It's arduous enough that nearly 700 miles some salmon will travel from the Pacific to Stoli Meadows, their birthplace and the birthplace of the South Fork of the Salmon River where they will spawn. They begin the trip about now and will arrive sometime in July during the hottest time of the year. To know the South Fork, I spent a week, not far from Stoli Meadows, backpacking along the shore. 
The temperatures were in excess of 100 degrees. My companions and I would rise early to walk in the coolest part of the day, and at night, we would sleep on top of our bags wishing the stars were rain, wishing for the slightest breeze to cool our skins. During the day, we took our books and lunches and bunched in a narrow stream drainage, where we kept our feet in the water, cooled our heads under a short forearm, soaked our hats and clothes in the cooler water of Pritzker Creek, only to have all of it parched within an hour. The winter before had been a dry one. There were fires throughout the west, and smoke was our unfortunate companion, and only seemed to intensify the heat. It was on that trip, working the nozzle of my water filter between rocks, that I saw the first dead sculpin. I turned to my friend, a fisheries biologist, who stood a few feet behind me just as she noticed the dead fish. I watched as a look of shocked sadness and then exasperation passed like a cloud across her face. She pointed a finger at a being who, despite their constancy in the river, stayed hidden, camouflaged, pressed against the river bottom without a swim bladder to give it buoyancy, and said, those are the river's thermometers. Seeking our own reading, we tied my backpack thermometer to a length of fishing line and sunk it in the water. A few minutes later, when we pulled it out, the reading was in the 70s. Not yet. My friend got on her knees at the water's edge, saying over and over, hot, hot, it's too hot, and shook her head as she looked into the water. Her stare dove past the reflection of sky, past what ripples remain, past the layer of thick, warm water to the thin, only slightly cool water below. She looked for salmon, not just with the eyes of a scientist, but with the look of a child who knew that something was wrong and that somehow they played a part in it. It's a look of regret and apology, one I've seen in the face of so many beloveds when they felt they were the cause of some hurt, some agony, be it from accidentally spilling their milk to the moment just after killing a deer. It's a look that says, what have I done? Salmon cannot survive in a river with a temperature that high. Is prayer a refugia? Though here I think it's important to point out the subtle difference between refugia and refuge, as subtle differences matter to the former. Whereas refuge is defined in Webster's Ninth New Collegiate Dictionary as a place that provides shelter or protection from danger or distress, or something to which one has recourse in difficulty. Refugia, in contrast, is defined as a geographical region that has remained unaltered by climatic change, such as glaciation, that affects surrounding regions and forms a haven for relics, fauna, what gives me pause in that sentence is the juxtaposition of climatic change and haven. But the word that stops me altogether is relict, which objectively means widow, but whose noun form represents plant and animal species living in isolation in a small localized area as survivors from an earlier period or as what's left of a nearly extinct group. My heart wanders to another friend who is with us, whose ancestors fished this river for salmon for thousands of years. I hear their voices and her prayers and stories. If it is the words that land between the hands or are cast on water when we fear losing of something, fear the losing of something loved, something beloved, of life itself, then prayer is merely refuge, and the refuge we beg is in the hands themselves. I lift the maroon sculpin from the sand 
and walk it out into the shallow water. I place my cupped hands in the water, then open them. The sculpin sinks almost immediately from my view. Its work is done, as if the river itself had sent a plea, a prayer to the feeble gods who have some power to save, as if it is trying to empower with a different godliness, as if the river has hope, hope in all things, us. Today there is neither abundance of heat nor sunshine. It's been weeks of this, and it's not so much the snow anymore as the moroseness that has settled in. I've been reckless as of late, attaching my emotions to seasons, thinking I'll be happier if I just hold out for change. I recall a bouquet of tulips sent by my late husband and a card that read, Hold on, spring is coming. But with it, I became a relic myself. When I needed shelter from the pain of losing him, I went to the winter memories and found it. What bliss and naivete. But who could have known, and how would I have changed the outcome, when it is only my choices I control? There is some science that proves the need for sun to lift the spirits. But there's science, too, that proves perspective is power. Rather than waiting for the warmer days that eventually I, too, will need relief from, I have grown non-judgmental of the weather and more interested in experiencing the days as they come, aligning myself with the will of the weather, moving through my days purposefully, trying to learn the song I am meant to sing the one that carries the tones of love, fear, regret, and apathy in its lines, the, ones, the one that defines me as human, just as the newly arrived cast in his finches and robins sing songs belonging just to them. Let it be that, though, that brings me <coughs> joy, the simple act of being, and not what I attach to it. Let it be the birds themselves who I will miss should they never again return, and not that, which I have projected upon them. Not a burden that is not theirs to carry. Let it be the salmon I am thinking of when I see the snow. Let it be their convenience I am praying for and not mine. Help me remember that the promise of a better future lies in my actions, not theirs. Two weeks ago, Caleb, the dogs, and I went down the mountain to Hell's Camp. We went to greet the season, to touch the skin of the earth, to see the colors the canyon held and hear the voices carried on the winds. Of a sunny morning, we decided to take a walk along the Snake River below Hell's Canyon Dam. It felt good to see the multiplicity of color. There were purple shooting stars, yellow meadow buttercup. The green of the moss that clung to the granite was the mother of the green that was worn by the maidenhair fern. On the rocky cliffs across the river, we spotted what looked like piles of snow, but piles of white fur was what it was on the thick bodies of a mountain goat. I removed my winter layers and let the sun bring out my colors too. I followed the blue line of water to where it led to the mouth of the canyon, and there the sunlight spilled across the river, strengthening the surface and for a moment, it seemed like a silver trail we could walk. Blue were the lines that were ripples around the rock. Blue was the sky where met the walls of the gorge which rose unbelievably high. Green were the pines that were staggered intermittently, sojourners on this self-same walk. And in the distance, the seven devils and blanketing their flanks and peaks, snow mountains and mountains of snow. There's the spring we seek. There, in the mind of winter, and the language written in the cold water is theirs, and the words, the message they carry is of hope. The snow has started again in earnest. Little fists of snow, snow like kisses blown in the air and frozen, snow in clumps as big as some of the smallest chickadees, snow that with a little more sun will 
begin to melt, and that water, as if desperate to return to its source, will start the journey down. Maybe some of the snow that I've watched off season will make its way to the Snake River, will flow past the place where my family and I walk. Past where runoff seeped from a granite wall, where I pressed my face against moss until my nose and cheeks were so cold they hurt. Past the place where after we turned away from the snow-packed mountains, turned back toward the dam, I saw the silver semi backing down to the river, its belly full of young salmon, its presence shadowed by the very contraption that created it. It backed up and a hose was placed in the water and a valve opened and thousands of young fish entered the river. I tried to find them in the current, but the river is a good mother, covering her own, and all I could see was cold water. Only water, just like now, only snow. So much snow it seems that there has always been and will forever be snow. And though it does not seem possible, it no longer seems mine. Maybe the river's desires have also become mine. For if rivers could hope, snow would be theirs. Love, Sam. Now if you take your hands again together, like this, can you see the South Fork of the Salmon River a little better? And where it might flow through those areas, the drainages that come down? Can you see how much life is in there? And to see where that cold water would be, that refugia, that refuge, you can turn your hands over. And in your hands now you can see life left. And you can see that they do something almost like giving like they're giving something away. And you can know that the future of places like the South Fork is right here.